We are live. All right. Thanks, guys, for joining the latest episode here live every Saturdays, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern time. Of course, my co-host, Brian the Beast Robinson. Today, we got David Richardson, founder of American Ninjutsu Warrior Concepts. He is a ninja. He's a magician. He's a former Marine. He's a bouncer. Basically, he is a badass. Thanks so much for joining us, David. I'm just a nice guy. Uh, just a nice guy. All To summarize, he's just a nice guy. I have but, to bring but, something up. We break, be, can I break the ice just real quick? Sure. Um, yeah. Just just to kind of wake everybody up a little bit. I have a deck of cards here. All right. Oh, boy. You're going to freak I, me out, aren't you? David, what I want you to do is, now, before I came on camera here, I turned a card upside down of my own inside this deck. What I want you to do, David, is just throw out a card, any card in your mind. Just, just yell it out. Um, uh, a four of diamonds. Four of diamonds. That's a good card. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove my deck here from the box very slowly. Nothing tricky. And tell me when you see my upside down card. It should be one card turned over. Tell me when you see it. There, there it is. What was your card again, sir? A, a four of diamonds. One, two, and three. Dude, like, how do you guys do that, man? Like, and I don't know if you want to reveal the trick. That's insane, though, because I was literally trying to think of, like, the most random card, you know, not like an ace of spades or anything, but just some random thing nobody would pick. Exactly. That's right. insane. <laughs> Now we can get started, shall we? Well, you broke the ice. You blew my mind, man. You'll have to tell me later. The beautiful thing. <laughs> anyway, anyway, one thing, and there's so much to discuss today. One thing I did want to ask, because and I made a without video. Without any further notice, I have not drunk the Kool-Aid, by the way. Okay, okay. That's a, that's a running gag among your show. Of, of course I it is. Yeah, related to, to Mr. Frank Dukes. I'm anti-Kool-Aid. Um, Shidoshi Dukes. I got to ask because I, I mentioned this. I did a video. got like 17,000 views last year. Pretty good video. Um, Popularity-wise. I mean, the topic's a little interesting. It had to do with like a letter that you received in the mail. Like, did you ever... It was like a death threat, man. Like, did you ever figure out or did you send it to the police? Like, did they ever figure out who the hell wrote that thing? Okay, so it was a... There's a backstory to that letter before I even got the letter, and it, it concerns a chat room that I was in. Um, this chat room, uh, it was a few other people in the chat room, a few other martial artists in the chat room. Um, the N-word was thrown out by, oh. by a guy by the name of Dallas Winningford, uh, Winningford or whatever his name is, uh, good friend of Frank Dukes. And uh, apparently this, this guy said the N-word concerning the death of that teenager that was killed out there. Um, I can't think of his name. Right? Trayvon. Trayvon Martin. Oh, okay, okay. So he, he said a very negative thing towards that kid that who's no longer with us, and and he used the N word when he said it. Jeez. So I, I, I called him out on it, and so did a few other people. And then Ashita Kim jumped in the room. You know who Ashita Kim is. He jumped in the room talking smack, and then Frank Dukes comes in the room and defends this guy. And mm. says the guy has that's just the way the guy talks, and it's just a Vietnam thing or whatever. And I and I basically said, no, there's no excuse ever. It's no excuse ever to use that word the way this guy used it. Mm -hmm. And so did everybody else. And so basically, that's what started the whole situation with me and Dukes again. And then after that, I received the letter in the mail, and that's what spearheaded the whole thing in regards to the letter. And do you think it was the guy that made that use well, that word? Whoever, in that wrote form? The, whoever wrote the letter knew that Dukes lived in Vegas. So whoever it was wanted me to think it was Dukes for one. Two, oh, okay. they knew they was in that room at that time as well. They was also in that room. Um, there were a lot of things in the letter that made me that that allowed me to know that whoever wrote it was in the room at the same time that that guy said that word. Um, so there you have it. But you never found out who actually wrote well, it. Well, so. I have my suspicions now on who really wrote the letter now. Yes. And you know who he is as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a crazy thing, man. And that's something that I'm sorry that you received in the mail. But, um, 
crazy. Now, as far as like, let's go to your martial arts training because you started in Duke's Rue back, I think in the 80s, the late 80s, right? 89, 1989. Did you go there because of the movie Bloodsport? <laughs> you know, what's interesting is that I was the late bloomer when it came to the martial arts period, for one. Uh, second, um, I had no idea about blood sport. I knew nothing about blood sport. Or maybe I knew about the movie because I had just got out the Marine Corps, but I didn't know that it was connected with uh, with Frank Dukes or Dukes Rule Ninjas or what have you. Um, the only reason why I decided to go to Dukes Rules because I couldn't find any other ninjutsu schools or what I thought was ninjutsu schools here in America when I got out the Marine Corps. Um, I had got shot at point blank range and Dang. At that time, I was looking for something to kind of uh, get my life back in you order. Again. I asked, was, was it in, in the military or on the street? No, no, it was in the street. All the action I've okay. seen was mostly in the street. <laughs> okay. So I was what, shot at point. What range. happened? Let's talk about that if you don't mind. Like, what? how'd you get in that situation? Um, Stupid. About three o'clock in the morning, I got the munchies and I decided to go out to get something to at, a, at a, one of those uh, all night gas stations. And um, I got to the window and this guy was there with his gun in my face, talking about he was gonna rob me and whatever. And keep in mind, I had, hadn't started training in the martial arts, not to say anything different, but um, he said he wanted all my money. So I tried to go for the gun because I thought the gun was fake, like mm -hmm. an idiot. And he just let loose. So I was hitting my wow. shoulder, the bullets now on my clavicle, and I was hitting my side, that one's on my spine. Dang. And luckily, luckily that the uh, the caliber of the pistol was small because yeah. if it was anything bigger, like a 38, I would have been oh, knocked on my ass and then they could have finished me off. Um, yeah. But luckily it was like, a, I think it was a 25 or a 22. Mm. Wow, that's horrible. Uh, so when you say you could have had the caliber been bigger, knocked on your ass and they the power the, you know, the power of the bullet would have definitely put me down. But because those bullets cal the caliber of those bullets were small, I was able to keep running as the guy was chasing. Oh, so you me. ran as as you once you found out it was real gun. Back killing as he was shooting. Oh, okay, um, okay. And I'm not and I didn't even realize this until after the fact was that he had somebody in a car waiting for him. So the car tried to run me over at the same time. Jeez. Oh, man. Yeah. Wow. So that basically you primarily went to martial arts to find a school strictly for self-defense. Not necessarily, though. Um, I'd always been interested in ninjutsu, and that's because of my magic background. Um, I don't know if you noticed or not, but magicians, magicians were known as, uh, I'm sorry, ninjutsu practitioners were known as magicians of mayhem on the battlefield. So that's what drew me to it. It was the deception and the... the uh, the distraction elements of, of the system itself. And with me being a magician already, I thought it was perfect, you know? So, so can I ask a quick question about that? So what would be one thing, cause this is really fascinating just because of the stuff I'm involved with, but on the battlefield, what would be something they would do? You would call like, it would be a magic trick on a battlefield That's a good that a ninja question. would employ. Very good question. Um, a little background about uh, magic when it comes to combat. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of a, a magician by the name of Masculine, but he was known as the combat magician. Or uh, what happened was the, uh, to help World win War the II, war. right? Yes, World sir. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. I, I know. I just wanted to make sure I'm thinking to say, go ahead. They used the combat aspects of camouflage in that. Um, so when the planes flew over, it looked like the tanks were really just. Um, uh, they were doesn't they were disguised tanks. In other words, there wasn't real tanks. So if you're if you were flying over the over the uh, field, all you saw was like maybe a hospital or maybe a, 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 a personnel vehicle to hide the fact that it was a real tank. Well, he used that. That's some camouflage technique that's used in magic as well on the battlefield. Yeah, that's interesting because he also uh, then they asked him. Cause he said he could make a, a ship disappear. It was just, you know, he was just being hyperbolic, whatever you call it when you act. Exactly. And they said to him, well, what can you do? What would you do? And he also is the one who invented the mock tanks, like the blow up tanks. 
Yes. That was him, and they deployed yes. him during Normandy. They put him wow, out. Wow, you did your homework, man. They, yeah, they convinced it was a whole other army, this big other army. Yeah, he, he made it seem like the troops over here. In reality, the yeah. troops were over here coming around. And and so what would that be like uh, for a ninja? Like, uh, how would how would they deploy something like that? That's what we'll, well, it's, we're talking concepts here. We're talking camouflage. We're talking distraction. We're talking, mm -hmm. you know, even Ali, I don't know if you know this, but Mahaba Ali was very, very intrigued by magic. And that's because of the distraction element of it. Ali loved magic. Uh, it was something that he, his footwork, if you look at his footwork, is very deceptive. You know, his, the movements, all that stuff he got from using, uh, learning magic and so forth. Magic was just a hobby to him, of course. But Concept wise, um, all that stuff could be applied to the battlefield, such as distraction, mm -hmm. camouflage, um, uh, all these things, pyrotechnics, you name it. Mm. Very and what, interesting. What kind of, um, if I may, one more question because I'm really fascinated by this side of stuff <laughs> is um, what, what would be a main thing? If you say ninjas, the biggest thing that would be on the battlefield, they would apply to be distracting or pyrotechnic. What was like something really profound you'd say would disturb the enemy? Um, well, they relied on something called a mystique called uh, the Tingu, which is more dealing with mm -hmm. mysticism more than anything else. But okay. Tingu was a, a mystical being that was that was set to put fear into the hearts of men or, or the enemy or what mm -hmm. have you. So mm. they utilize that to their to their advantage, you know. So let's say, for example, you're in a battlefield and and you were to see uh, so, like something move behind be, behind where nothing's supposed to be, and you see something move. Oh, guess what? Mm. Now you got fear in the hearts of your enemy. Um, mm. Shuriken people people always thought about Shuriken, which was the throwing stars that you saw used um, by the ninja. These throwing stars wasn't really meant to be lethal. They wasn't meant to 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 kill someone, they were used as a distraction as well. Imagine a throwing star cutting through the air and, and slicing you and cutting you, maybe, and you're in, in, the, in the battlefield. Well, guess what? Now this person can go back and tell his friends or his whoever's working with them that he was cut by an invisible enemy. He couldn't see the person mm. who cut him. He was cut. Mm. He was cut by. Him. As far as he's concerned, it was just a sword. Little did he know, it was just a shrieking from a distance. Oh, that's interesting. Very uh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. Let let's let's go back to Duke's Roost. So when you started training there, how was the training? Intense. Oh yeah. Intense. And we're talking about now someone had just got out the Marine Corps. We had just got I just got out the Marine Corps and um uh, I, I joined Duke's Rue and I'm telling you the training was off and don't let's not forget about the black belt test. That was a whole nother world in itself. In fact, I failed the first time. But um, yeah, very intense, very intense. Well, <laughs> I got to ask about the black belt test now. So how long were you training in Duke's Rue before you got to test for the black belt in that system? Uh, I started training in Duke's Rue in 89. I was ranked in my first Dan in 1990, 1996. Uh, I failed the first time, like I said, and I passed the second time. Um, it's a three-day test, though. We're talking, and I call it the three-day test of hell, because they uh, we're talking everything when it comes to pain, when it comes to breaking you down, making sure that you're you're at your bare essentials. Because if you think about it, anybody can do a technique perfect or uh, uh, whatever it is, a flow, what have you, perfect when you're fresh. But when you're tired and hurting and you want to give up, can you do it then? Which makes sense. In a, in a real situation, that's where you're going to be. You're not going to be all fresh. You're in a, in a real situation, you're going to be so tired and hurting and fear and all that stuff is going to come into play. So, And that's what I, I got a lot of when it came to pressure testing my techniques. Pressure testing and aliveness is very, very important when it comes to real combat. Do you consider Duke's Rue ninjutsu or not, though? I do not consider Duke's Rue ninjutsu ninjutsu. It's not a traditional ninjutsu, ninjutsu in itself. But um, we got Koru and we got Gendai. Koru being more of a traditional traditional aspects, uh, something that was historical. And then you got Gendai, which is more of a modernized. So they've taken 
uh, some traditional uh, aspects and apply it to modern combat. But do I consider it historical, traditional, and just no, it's not. Which is, a, I, re, I think, this is the reason why Dukes decided to spell it with an uh, a, a, a I instead of a U. When you when you hear this, when you see the spelling, it's it's not ninjutsu. It's not ninjutsu. It's ninjutsu. Interesting. Because he wanted he wanted everybody to 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 understand that it was his interpretation of ninjutsu. Okay. Did you actually spend a lot of time training with Frank Duke, though? No, not at all. Not at all. Was he just not there, or was he training other students? Uh, he was. He oh, he was there, and he wasn't there. But you gotta understand, the, at the level that he was at, he had black belts <laughs> that he had trained. You know, first generation and second generation. So mm -hmm. why 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 should he have to teach anybody? Although I I trained on them a few times. But for the most part, his his high ranking students who were black belts were my instructors. Opinion on Frank Dukes as a martial artist? What do you think about him? Oh, in his heyday, he was all, he was no joke. Okay, he was no freaking joke. And and even now, um, coming from the standpoint of uh, of his theories and his concepts and so forth, when it's applied to what it is that you're doing. It's off. It's off the chain. I mean, you can't be replaced. It's it's very very scientific, but it's not ninjutsu. I repeat, it's not ninjutsu. When Why? you say that, do you mind if I ask one real quick? Sure. When you say it's not ninjutsu, are you talking about the techniques, the fighting techniques? Or are you talking about the mental concept of what a ninja actually is? First of all, I love your questions. By the way, first of all, there's no fighting techniques that that just strictly ninjutsu. There isn't. Okay, you, we're talking about samurai who were ninja and vice versa. Um, these techniques on the battlefield, Aki Jitsu, Jiu Jitsu, um, many different aspects of the martial arts were applied, Judo, you name it. But keep in mind that these, these were integrated into the fighting warriors, into what they were doing. So it wasn't a, a, it wasn't a, a set techniques that were applied to just ninjutsu practitioners by themselves. Ninjutsu in itself is just a spy craft. It's basically... It's basically uh, espionage, infiltration, uh, assassination, and so forth. All these things dealing with spycraft. Um, like the but, CIA to a certain extent. Basically, well, yes, yes. If you want to go to Universal, uh, during any warring periods throughout the world, everybody had their equivalents of ninjutsu. Japanese just didn't have, the Japanese just, just have their monopoly on, on spycraft. No, you had different... Uh, warring sections throughout the world who specialized in maybe two or three people doing what a platoon couldn't do. Mm. I have another question related to Frank Dukes. So you... Oh, you're just really on that Kool-Aid, aren't you? Well, not so much on the Kool-Aid, just um, like... <laughs> messing with you. Because you, you know, you're, you're a black belt in that system. You've trained in the system. And I've heard people that actually train with them, you know, they say, like, the guy knows his stuff, you know. Why do you think he has a bad reputation, though? It, it's primarily online, right? YouTube videos, forums, stuff like that. No comment. No comment. Okay. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. He's always a, a controversial figure for good or bad. But oh, an interesting one. So didn't you go to Japan after training in Duke's Roo, I believe? Because he wanted yes, to. I did. Yes, I did. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, I in 1996, after receiving my first Dan in Duke Shiru, I started teaching. I was teaching at USC. I was teaching for different uh, uh, subleasing a couple of martial arts schools around town here in LA, and then um, Dukes and I fell out. For the first time and i decided to, i needed to find out one to find out where the real quote-unquote ninjutsu was and i'd heard about hasumi sensei and uh i decided well, to try well, david to not to cut you off uh why did you guys have a falling out for the first time at that point in time no comment okay <laughs> all right let's go to, to japan then <laughs> <laughs> so we're in japan <laughs> So it's my first time there, and um, 
I was just amazed at the people there, the, the culture, the food. Um, and keep in mind, I, my taste when it comes to food, I, I, so I basically ate American food while I was in Japan for the most okay. part. Love the women though, love the women. Um, so I started training at a, in, in Osaka, uh, at a place uh, in Osaka. And, uh, and this is my first introduction into uh, ninjutsu being abroad, of course. And um, I trained in Tokyo a couple of times and came back. And that was my first impression of ninjutsu when I first went to Japan for the first time. And thereafter, four different times after. Can I now, ask what you a question? Think, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, what did they think about you, your skill set? Because I'm you, so you, I'm so glad you asked that. I didn't, yeah. I don't, because I don't want to come off as being negative and I'm not, I'm not negative, but I'm not going to lie. My first introduction into ninjutsu was very negative when it came to the Bujikan. Um, they had heard, unfortunately it comes with Duke's rule. Um, they had heard that I had trained under Frank Dukes and they figured I was coming to Japan just for opportunistic pictures and so forth with Asumi sensei. So they had me all wrong, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got a very nasty letter uh, from them. Here I go with the letters again. I don't know why. People like writing me letters. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a letter stating that if I come there, I'll be considered to be a charlatan and that everybody will know and don't even bother to come. And by the way, have I tried to have I tried to blow fish this time of the year? That was a sarcastic oh my remark. God. Yeah, exactly. It was sarcastic remarks stating yeah. that because Point blowfish was poisonous during that time of the year. So this person was very nasty. Wow. So I said, okay. So before I went for the first time, I wrote a letter to another instructor out there. Uh, I think he was a Daishian. And I wrote him, let him know this, if this is the way potential students are treated and uh, the, with the rudeness that this guy did, then I don't want to be a part of the Khan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know this guy wrote me back again to state that he apologized for the way he treated me and I'm welcome there and please forgive him and all this stuff. And he'll see me when I get there. I go there that first time and um, I did my thing. I did my training and so forth. Of course, I, was, you know, the way Duke's rule move and the way the Bujikan members move is totally different. Um, so I had to get used to that. I came back to America and I got a letter from the same creek. And do you know he had the nerve to say, I move stiff and you don't like the way I move? I, and I said to myself, why didn't you say something to me when I was there? You know, why sure. would you even, you, you're a freaking coward. He could have said, he could have said anything negative to, to me while I was there. He mm -hmm. couldn't wait till I get back to America to write me an email. <laughs> <laughs> now, can I ask a quick question about, um, and, and this, um, so I studied Gojuru Karate. For, for many, many years, right? And then I, I actually live, was able to live in Korea for a year. And now I'm going to ask you a question. Did you find it? I, this was something that kind of I realized when I went to Asia is I didn't truly understand Goju um, karate, the, the concepts of the way it was created, not the techniques as much as why we did the things we did, our rituals, until I understood Asia, Asian culture. Would you say to truly understand being a ninja, you have to experience Asian culture? Well, <laughs> being first of all, being a ninja in this day and time is obsolete, you ask me. I don't think uh, nin a ninja exists in this day and time. Are the ninjas the practitioners? Yes, they are. But as far as a ninja, no, I don't think they exist. Um, I've been to Philippines, I've been to Korea, I've been to Japan. And in fact, when I went to the Philippines to answer your question, I was looking for a screamer, a Kali a screamer. Although yeah, I had learned really American right. movement, uh, I had I wanted to learn some traditional stuff. Come to Are find you a out, Jit Kune Do guy, by the way? Is that why you were going? Were you a Jit Kune Do or just? Well, I just love mixing things up. I love mixing okay, it up. Okay. You know, so I go to the Philippines and come to find out they don't do that. And that's not something that they do on a regular basis in their school. It's in their schooling. As far as like what we do in basketball or football or baseball, that's what they do 
as far as their curriculum is concerned, is our niece. Our niece is a part of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's not something mm -hmm. that you will see it at a dojo or a school, or what have you. We, we're the only ones, Americans, who embrace that. Same thing with Japan. When I got to Japan, ninjutsu was something that was considered to be manga or they don't take it too serious, you know. They have tourist attractions, of course, but we're the only ones that's all ninja this and ninja that and, you know. When you came back, I know you said you were uh, in Japan, I believe, four times, but when you came back and primarily stayed in America, did you find a, a Bujikan school to train at? Yes, I did. I was very fortunate to find an instructor by the name of uh, Sensei uh, David Dow. And I trained with him for three years and uh, got my first Dan ranked under him. Um, and keep in mind, this instructor, uh, Sensei David Dow, was very prolific in, in regards to uh, his methods of training. He really truly believed in aliveness and he really truly believed in pressure testing your techniques. That's something that's unheard of with, with the Bujikan. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, that's just something that they don't, they don't do. So, uh, and he got a lot of flack for that. He got a lot of flack for that uh, because he was breaking <clears throat> the protocol when it came to, uh, and, and, and keep in mind, nowadays in the Bujikan, you, you're going to see a lot more sparring and, and what have you. But for the most part, that's not something that they do when it comes to aliveness and so forth. In fact, he had an instructor come down and try to embarrass us um, by making us, by, by making some kind of point uh, to show that we should not be learning aliveness at that level and pressure testing <clears> our <throat> techniques. So he put me on the floor with this guy. Keep in mind, I'm just a first cue. First cue, that means I'm very close to getting my first Dan. So mm -hmm. um, he puts me in a floor with this guy. This guy's a fifth a fifth Dan in the Bujikan. Mm -hmm. And I and I, he said, David, go for it. So <laughs> the guy comes in there and he kind of, kind of tried to knock me around a little bit, right? And I didn't, apparently I didn't get the memo. So I'm just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. So I co-cocked the guy. <laughs> co-cocked him. I mean, and I gave him a good one. He stops the match and says he wants to, there's no more, no more. He stops the match. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, so I guess David gave him that look like, see, it does work. <laughs> mm. And you uh, already was, trained in, in Duke's Reef for such a long time too. So even if you were just on your way to first Dan in, in Bujikan, well, like. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wasn't on spring chicken, of course, but. The most part is he knew what he was doing by putting me on the floor with that guy. And mm -hmm. of course, two weeks later, I was ranked in my first day. And I don't want to say I got I, I got that rank off of knocking that guy's block off, but it is what it is, right? How would you define yourself as a martial artist as somebody asked? Because I know you you your Duke's Rue, Bujikan, sounds like you got some training elsewhere, but how, how would you just define yourself? Would you say I'm a Duke's Rue guy, I'm a Bujikan guy, or what would you say? I would say that I'm a student of life. Okay. I'm a student of life. I use what works. I teach what works. Um, I don't try to sugarcoat anything. If it works, use it. <clears throat> kind of like Baby. Jeet Kune Do then. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, actually, yeah. Do you, you might have a question think, about your technique? Bruce called it the classical mess out the window, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> the grave. You had the little grave, remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. Classical man, something like that. Yes, uh, something like yes. That. You might I ask you a technique question. So please, you really, please. you, you. So I spend a lot of time with Terrible Tim Witherspoon, uh, one considered one of the greatest Philly Shell masters, one of the founders, uh, great godfathers of the Philly Shell. <clears throat> and I run a YouTube channel. We we train constantly. We're always around each other. David got to train with him a bit, and you oh, were sure. saying something interesting. I'm going to tell you why. When you talked about, and this, I've not heard a lot of martial arts people say at all. When you talked about this hand not leaving the body, right? Now, we approach the jab differently. You know, in, in the shell, there'll be, you're tapping at it. But you mm -hmm. said you do it a little, you have your, your own. But you said you never, you, you don't defy leaving the hand, getting the hand too far from the body. It's and that necessary. is a... This works right. as an antenna. This is like now an is antenna. that is that from Duke's Rue or is that from boxing? 
No, no, no. <laughs> That's from Detroit. Really? Because yes. that is very, very Philly. A Philly shell, a lot of people say, no, the Philly shell doesn't exist. It's a concept. It's not a defensive position. Like, people think it's a shell. Is like a, it's like you're in an egg, mm. and everything is always tight. We never, you're never reaching out. You never well, reach out. Keep, in mind, keep in mind, this is not just, just this, too. We're talking footwork as well. Footwork mm. implemented, mixed in with that. So I'm not saying this is going to work by itself. Your footwork, right, your right, angling, thing, yeah. the angling, your footwork, all that stuff comes into play when it comes right. to utilizing uh, offensive and defensive techniques. I thought that was interesting. So, you know, just some little credibility there. You know, I don't know anything about it. you, too. Yes, sir. But, uh, <laughs> you, you just said something there that Tim would be very, very rarely do you even hear boxers talk about that um, that barrier. You, you're never out here when we, and we're in the box in the Philly show. We're never, we never reach the block ever. So, but anyways, I digress on that. That was very interesting. You brought that up though. I'm glad you brought that up because um, I've worked as a bouncer uh, at a nightclub in, in Hollywood for about 20 years. And um, I developed a way of being cordial and being protective. But at the same time, I'm ready to go. So I, I go here. I, I kind of see here, I'd be like, calm down. Everything's going to be okay. You know, it's, and, and that to me, that's a way of me being protective of myself. But at the same time, they don't realize how close it is that I'm able to uh, get past their defenses mm. as well. Um, but you're talking about a way of pressure testing and pressure testing your techniques and the likeness and so forth. You really learn what it, what's going to work and what's not going to work <laughs> when when you're doing what that, you know, especially being a bouncer and so forth, you know, going to the street, going to the ground, that's the last place you want to be when it comes to combat in a situation like that. A controlled environment, no problem. But when it comes to an uncontrolled environment, such as the streets, a nightclub, a bar, you name it, no. So although we may learn how to defend ourselves on the ground, it's not something that we're going to do. We're going to live on the ground. You got to learn what it takes and what it is to be like, what it's like to be on the ground to be to defend against it. And that's mm -hmm. something that we, we, we learned as well. Yeah. That's very similar to Krav Maga, for example, you do learn ground techniques, but they do preach, get the hell off the ground. If you're there, here's a couple of things. You know? <laughs> um, are you still currently bouncing these days or not? No, I'm retired, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's definitely a way you could have pressure tested all those martial arts for sure. Let's talk about, for whatever reason, there's a lot of drama in the martial arts world, and it seems more so in the ninjutsu world. Can you talk a little bit? I know you had a, a feud with a couple of people, like Don Rowley, for example. Oh, Lord. Interesting stories related to that. Uh, that whole group, that whole group is just... Bullshit Martial Arts is the name of the group, excuse my language, BSMA. Uh, Don Raleigh is the person who spearheads the group. And this is a high ranking member of the Bujikan, by the way, which is very embarrassing. Um, mm. But yeah, that guy, and I come to the realization that he's sick, he's deranged, and there's something mentally wrong. And I'm not saying that just to be funny, but I really think that he's mentally disabled in, in that regard, because we're talking about somebody who lived and breathed um, negative uh, negative things when he came to Frank Dukes, myself, and so forth. Um, and he has a couple of his companions, Dill Dugas and um, Melvin Frank, Melvin Williams. Um, Melvin, by the way, is another one of the uh, group, one of, is a part of that group as well. Very, very negative people. I mean, we have a person uh, who's right high ranking in the Bujikon, um, who passed away by the name of Papa San. And he passed away, rest in peace, about a few years back. And his daughter, you know, she's still alive and doing her thing and training and so forth. Melvin Williams of the Bullshit Martial Arts Group had the nerve to contact her and say some very negative things about her dead father. And I just couldn't believe it. This is somebody, Melvin Williams is somebody who's a Shihan in the Bujikan. So we're talking about quality control when it comes to, uh, the Bujikan and certain things that needs to be taken care of when it comes to the certain people who represent that organization. 
What do you think Don Rowley and his group, why the issue with you and Dukes? Do you think he was just jealous that you guys were getting all the attention as ninjas? And <laughs> Right. Um, I don't know. Um, Rowley, to me, it, it, it appears from because I'm from the outside looking in, looks like he's just bored. Like he doesn't have anything else better to do. Like he's bored. And it's so funny is that he moves like a like a pregnant yak, you know? So for him to have the nerve to say something negative about anybody, you know, it's pretty redundant. So I don't know. Him, the whole group, uh, it's just it's ridiculous. And it, and like I said, it's an embarrassment. Didn't he like challenge people? He might have even challenged you to like right. a fight he challenged with like me. weapons and stuff. Uh, to me, but as it turns out, he found every excuse in the world not to come out here. In fact, he actually had a so I arranged for us to meet in a mutual halfway point, which was Utah, and okay. uh, for him to, for us both to meet there. And he once again found an excuse not to come there. And then all of a sudden, his his ankle mysteriously got twisted, and he wasn't able to come. Period. So there you have it. We call them uh, keyboard warriors. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of those. <laughs> Me and Brian know all about that. Um, thoughts on a guy named Phil Elmore, and I'll and I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Let me read Actually, you. A I saw the real... video. I saw the video. Of <laughs> Phil saying the things he said. It's so yeah. Funny. And I'll read I'll, uh, real quick, David. I'll read a quote. This is why I bring him up. Uh, wow. For the record, I don't know Phil that much. I don't have an issue with him. I've spoken to him on Facebook. I interviewed him before. So I don't know the guy that much, but I don't have an issue with them. But here's something that he said about me, and, and he mentioned your name. That's why I wanted to see like what kind of history you guys have, because he said Viking Samurai has endorsed people like David Richardson, which I'll endorse your magic, man. We've seen that trick at the beginning. It's amazing. But 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 he also said David Richardson, who is a dangerous lunatic who constantly threatens to murder people he doesn't like. Like, where is he getting that from? Because, like, you seem like the nicest guy, man. Well, you know, I love that. Hey, actually, that sounds like a movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, like I said, he was part of that group. And he said those things that he said. <clears throat> and it was, if you ask me, it sounds like it's over the top. But the funny thing about that whole thing is about a couple months after he said what he said, he called me up and said that he apologized about anything that he would hear that I would hear later because of the fact that he was involved with Raleigh. Now that he's no, he, then he, as, as it turns out, he was no longer involved with that group and he wanted to apologize about anything that he had, that I had heard come out of his mouth negative in regards to me. So that's why when I heard that, I started laughing because this is what he was talking about. I didn't know what he was talking about until I saw it on your show, on your show. Sure. Okay. So he was just teamed up fighting Raleigh and those guys' fight. I, I'll give him credit though that he actually apologized because not a lot of people would do that. Oh no! You know, exactly. So I, I, thought, I, I was really uh, taken aback by that. I thought that was really uh, out of his character. I didn't expect it. So when he said what he said, I was like, "Wow. Okay." Thanks, you man. know what's interesting about that too is I've always been fascinated. It hadn't been somebody. I took the martial arts very serious when I was younger, the whole Mishudo way of the warrior. And, you know, I, I molded my character. It's the idea that these people who are supposed to be so senior can be so unknowable and, uh, you know, have have a very small understanding of honor and and, and being noble. Like, I, I, and then all of a sudden you act like that, and it's so demeaning to what they're representing that you, you actually lose faith. You say, all these guys, they're supposed to be these masters and here they are, like an unhinged young young person, you know, just not acting stable and sane and warrior like. You know, you want to see stoicism, you know, but not this drama kind of, you know, uh, almost childish at times. I think there's a saying in that regard, in regards to us meeting our heroes or someone that we look up to. The one thing that's saying is that don't meet them. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody don't said that them. to me the other day. <laughs> don't. <laughs> because they will let you down. The truth of the matter is they're human. They're human. You know, we all well, have I got to say, I'm going to make a profound statement right now. Just to everybody out there, David, I was his, he was my hero. When he came here, he did not let me down. I want to put that out to the world. I, and and <laughs> I want to add to that. 
and this I'm not trying to rub your shoulder in the right way or whatever. The truth of the matter is what you're doing in regards to this forum and giving everybody opportunity to, to speak out and so forth. And I love the way you say that you're you're you're, you're neutral. For, you know, you got to give everybody a platform to express themselves, but you're neutral for God's sake. And for someone to take that and say, oh, he's drinking a Kool-Aid. No. Yeah, so what you're doing, man, I really think I want to commend you on a job well done. Keep it up. Oh, thanks, and man. What's, like, funny is, day... what's funny is you're not going to be able to do this for too much longer because you're going to be a superstar one day. And when that happens, <laughs> you're going to have people representing you doing this for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be able to say what I'm like, you're making you your brand now, you. sir. Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> You're going to be out in Hollywood. I'll be doing the show all by myself. You're going to be too big, for God's sake. <laughs> It'll be fun to do this show if I blow up. That'd be even funner then, right? We get a much bigger audience. Yeah, <laughs> but we're trying to actually... start to build it by being consistent every Saturday. So thanks again, David, for joining. We got to talk about, let's move into the magic. When you got involved with magic. Okay. Um, now, that's... Although in the martial arts, I'm kind of like a late bloomer. The magic is the opposite. I started doing magic when I was just an adolescent. So I had started magic when I was 11 years old, and it was just a hobby at one point. Um, I was just, my mother bought me a magic stand, and I just kept doing magic tricks. And next thing you know, I'm getting paid for it. I'm getting paid to make people happy for a living, for God's sake. It's a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. uh, magic has taken me around the world, national TV, you name it. Um, so, yeah. What's your favorite magic trick that you perform? Ha. I do so much magic. Um, I'm one of those magicians that, since I love the art so much, um, there's certain magic that intrigues me so much, such as, such as levitations and um, magic that involves uh, technology and so forth. Um, I'll tell you what doesn't impress me or doesn't please me when it comes to being a magician. That's uh, mind reading and uh, things of that nature. I'm not really, and it's so funny is that I did a card trick on you, but actually I'm allergic to card tricks. What, what do you I mean? Don't, I'm allergic to card tricks. I don't like card tricks, but let's face it, it's the easiest thing to carry with you when you want to impress somebody or show somebody something. It's a deck of cards. So <clears throat> I use card magic as a networking uh, device for the most part, but card magic is not one of my uh, things. I'm more of a stage magician. Birds, fire, levitations, things of that nature. Oh, that's cool, man. Where can somebody book you or see you, for example, live? Uh, I do a lot of corporate events, nightclubs, private parties. Um, you have an email? I'll put it I have up a website, here on I have a website, an email, which is connected What's to the What's the name website. of it? I'll post it. I'll actually find it right now and I'll I'll post it. Oh, okay, What's great. The name of the website? Um, I have two different websites. One's for the okay. magic, one's for the martial arts. The magic is magic of, uh, I'm sorry, ninjamagic.com. Ninja. And that's going to be N-I-N-J-A-M-A-G-I-K.com. All right, I'm going to write that down right put, now. Put Ninja. that up, Brian, on the screen. Ninja magic, all one word. Now here's a question, David, because I know you also go by and represent the name The Magic of Dorian. Correct. Where'd That's that come from? That's um, your state name. Okay. I'm glad you asked that. That actually leads back to what we talked about earlier. Uh, in the 70s, for all you, I'm really dating myself now, um, there was a magician that fought crime in the streets uh, on a TV show called The Magician. And instead of using a gun, this is during the heyday of all these all these cops cop thrillers um where the cops use guns to subdue their their um the criminals well real, real real quick i just want to correct one thing brian i think it's with a k ninja magic with a k right david oh yes n-i-n-j-a-m-a-g-i-k okay that's for like real magic right isn't that how you're supposed to spell real magic or something that's my understanding yeah 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 okay i just want to make sure we got the right uh website yep, on i'm there. sorry so there it out. is okay cool <laughs> there it is Okay, so um, so this magician that fought crime was Bill Bixby, and he they had different episodes. I think it was two seasons on one season, what have you. And in the pilot episode, his name was Dorian. Dorian, the magician, what have you. So he would fight crime, use cards as shuriken, 
um, throw birds at his opponents to distract them or what have you, fire, you name it. So he was using magic as a as a as an element of surprise and distraction and so forth. The way someone would use a gun, but a you know with a gun being lethal, uh, I think they were trying to get away from that. The producers of the show, so that's what the the magician was about. To answer your question, since he went by that name Dorian, I was a kid at the time, and I said one day I want to grow up and be just like that cat. Mm. <laughs> and Very it's cool. so funny because throughout his his um. His acting period, he did a lot of TV shows, and I was a big fan of Bill Bates before he passed away. And um, like I said, he used that name, Dorian, on a pilot episode of The Magician, which is the reason why I decided to adopt myself as utilizing that, that name. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently, Oscar Wilde wrote a book called The Picture of Dorian Gray, and basically it was a story about... Uh, story about a guy who was very, uh, I guess he was very, uh, bad, very vain. So he had a curse put on a picture so that the picture would age and he wouldn't. And he was also a ladies man as what well. What year was this? What year was this? What was this? What, what um, year? What, oh, when the Dorian this... the Magician? Yes. I the remember 70s. this. The se I, you, you're, bring, you're just giving me a, a flashback. I remember that. Yes, Go sir. on, I'm sorry, but you just gave, just gave me a flashback from my childhood. <clears throat> right? So I decided, I thought that, that name was just fantastic. And then I'd heard about Oscar Wilde's book, um, The Picture of Dorian Gray, and I just thought it was good. I think it was a cool, cool, cool name. I mean, David was already taken, of course. You know, David Copperfield, David Blaine, so forth. So Dorian was good, Mystique, and all that good stuff. Oh, for sure. Speaking of... Um other magicians like who are the ones you really look up to <clears throat> mm. well i would nowadays i look up to myself for the most part but uh i guess as i was coming up um david copperfield was somebody that i really kind of connected with because of, 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 of his style on stage and the way he moved and i love music and i love the way he incorporates music into his magic and so forth so that was one of my uh, kind of my like my uh, I want to say idol, but I really liked the way he he performed his magic. Oh, very cool. Let's talk about the um, the other website you have related to the ninja stuff. You want me to oh, this, that too? the name of that website is modernamwc.com. Modern. And so is this like? Are you a martial arts instructor today where if people go to that website? Is that what that website's for? Correct. And uh, my, I have instructors under me who work as well. Where's your school at or is it online training? We do online training and we also work at a park. We teach at a park as well. Okay. Uh, I think that, looks, that looks different. Let's see. A oh, and <laughs> it's going to be ANWC. A American, oh, okay. American Ninja to Warrior Concepts. Oh, okay, WC. so American Ninjutsu Warrior Concepts, is there like a curriculum where somebody would basically training long enough be a, the equivalent of a black belt in your system? I'm sorry, what's the question again? Oh, it's like, is this like something where if somebody trained long enough with you and or your instructors, they would be the equivalent of a black belt in that system? Is it like a martial arts curriculum like karate or taekwondo where you... No, we, we, yes, we have a complete curriculum. It's not Bujikan, it's not Duke Shru. It's uh it's American Ninja to Warrior Concepts. Um so it we've we've taken a lot of elements and concepts and uh derived it towards what we do as well. So we're a system um, up upon ourselves. It's not it's not either either or of those uh two schools. Would you say it's like a best of Duke's Rue of Bujikan, or is it not really? Like if somebody took Duke's Rue or Bujikan and then they took your system, would they have a lot of familiarity? Oh yeah, most most definitely because we've borrowed from both from both uh, organizations, but at the same time, we've moved on and beyond what it is that that um, that I learned uh, when I was training at the time. Okay. Now you mentioned uh, Bujikan quality control earlier. Like how, how would they fix Bujikan? Because that's all that's 
I'll just say it's something that kind of has a bad reputation. Like if you just do research, you know, and I, I, and I don't doubt there are some very legit practitioners, but it does kind of have a bad reputation. It might even be in, related to some of the people who, you know, are involved with it that we had mentioned earlier. Well, the interesting thing about the Buchicon is that, like I said, when it comes to quality control, we're not just talking about techniques and um, being able to do something on the floor, be able to defend yourself or utilizing. Uh, we're talking about someone who represents themselves uh, from a standpoint of uh, the type of person that they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by more, more so quality control, you know, idiots, people that misrepresent the organization because of the way their behavior outside of the dojo, not just inside the dojo. Um, so that's, that leaves a lot to be said when it comes to that. Um, in regards to the physical aspects of it, when it comes to combative and um, techniques and so forth, which is interesting is there's a, there's a guy by the name of um, Akban. Um, he's an Israeli uh, martial artist, but he trains Bujikan. And he, was, he learned by one of the first generation uh, Bujikan uh, instructors by the name of Doran. But this particular uh, instructor, Akban, He's been criticized as not looking like he's doing Bujikan at all. So people look at what he's doing and they say, oh, that's not Bujikan. That's not, that's not. Well, the funny, the funny thing is, guess what they're looking at? His aliveness. His aliveness and his pressure testing techniques. The people that are criticizing him are Bujikan members who are looking at him and saying, oh, that's not, that's not what we do. That's not what you do. Of course, it's not what you do. It's called aliveness. It's called pressure testing your techniques so that can I ask you about that real pressure. quick? So what you're saying is kind of like um, when you see, let's say somebody learned, uh, I'll use an analogy from boxing. Somebody learned the Philly shell, but never actually got in the ring. So it might look one way, but then you put a person in the ring, their Philly shell will morph into something very distinctly their own. Although it's, is the shells concept of the shell, but it morphs into something that's their own. And you're saying that this guy, because he's been fought a lot, he has been, his has become alive. It's become him. It's been his expression, kind of like Bruce Lee talks about. Well, yes, he's moved beyond just the technique. He's moved beyond just the movement and what have you. He's applied it to real life situations under pressure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, you're going to look at it, and, and if you've never done anything like this in your system, you're going to you're going to say it's not what you do. Of course, it's not what you do. And, and you need to ask yourself, why are you saying that? Okay. Uh, you'd mentioned you're a student of life earlier, David. And I think that's how everybody should be, by the way. Any, any words of wisdom that you can share with us? <laughs> um, I got something really cool. Uh, I learned uh, nine principles of Masashi. Um, and this, so these are principles that have been applied on, not only to just combat, but for business, to life. You name it. Um, one, do not think dishonestly. Uh, number two, become acquainted with every art. Number three, know the ways of all professions. Number four, become acquainted, uh, distinguish between gains lost and worldly matter. Five, develop intuitive judgment and understanding in every day. Number six, pay attention to trifles. Number seven, do nothing that's of no use. Uh, number eight, what was number eight? Uh, Perceive the thing that cannot be seen. And I think it's a number nine. I can't think of it right now. The ways in the training. Yeah, great stuff. Anybody watching it's, this, myself included, will have to rewind this section and, and, and get that a couple of times to really let it sink in, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, very cool, man. I'm hey, a Brian, big, you got any other... Uh... I'm a really big book fanatic. I love books. Um, I feel like knowledge is, knowledge is power, one. But two... Um, I, I feel that you should always be open to learning different ways of, you know, whether it's Western medicine, Eastern medicine, spiritual growth, uh, self-help, all these things, all these books, all this knowledge has something to offer. Every martial art in itself has something to offer. So I offer, I mean, so I think that um, I kind of like, I consider myself a student of life in that regard because I feel like the world is just one big college for us to learn. 
And so you're an avid reader. It's funny because I've I meet a lot of people, David Taylor, and from engineering celebrities, and all the most intelligent, impactful people read. They all read books. I've always found that they're big. Yeah. I'm not a big re book reader, so it says something about me. But but you gotta you're a book you reader. Something if you find something that intrigues you, you won't be able to put it down. It 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 is that's what it takes. And I learned how to I learned not to be that big book reader flying on an airplane 13 hours 13 hours you learn <laughs> real quick or you fall asleep but i learned my first uh i read my first novel going back and forth to japan you know um i think that's a testament to your intelligence level though i've just find everybody who are very insightful unique people are avid readers and and it's just a common trait i seen throughout uh, all of these people. I'm fortunate to meet a lot of incredible people, but the really deep, deep ones are just avid readers. Yeah. Even Bruce was. Bruce yes, loved was. it. Bruce he had a whole a library. Big. Yeah. A whole library. He was a better philosopher, actually. That, wait a minute. I got it here, brother. Let's see if I got it here. Where is it? Uh, maybe I don't. I got my... Dao of Jit Kune Do. You got the Dao. <laughs> Dao. Everybody... Here. Everybody should have the doll, man. The doll of important Kondo. book. Yeah, I kind of feel like that's the whole reason we're here is to learn yes. and to experience things in our it? lifetime. So, student, no, I, I had it over here. Actually, I was reading it. Well, David and I sit across from each other and I was showing them <laughs> stuff. And I said, I have an old book, Beer Knuckle Boxing Book. And it's the same one that Bruce Lee took pictures from and, and yes. put in his. It's uh, Hartzell yes. was the guy yes, who wrote sir. it. And Yes, I have sir. that book. Very yes, interesting sir. book. Tim and I have gone over it. And there's some very um, different thoughts about boxing back then. But um, yeah. 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 I don't know where it is. I do have it around there somewhere. My uh, Jit Kune Do. Uh, speaking of things in your proximity, uh, David, like what what's this stuff you got? Like these swords and this other stuff you got in the background here. Oh, okay. These, these are... Uh... You got katana here, da katana, and then we got the suba, which is the, the handguard of the swords. These are the suba. These are throwing stars. These are both shrieking here. And this is more of a samurai uh, uh, samurai uh, uh, tools utilized. Um, so I just thought this was really good as a good background. <laughs> oh, it looks great. Thanks. Oh, there's a dial. That's it. <laughs> I have it, brother. I've had yeah. I've owned, I've, earned, I've owned two copies of that. One was out when I was in a uh, junior high school, and now I have the copy that I have now. It's the whole reason I was a Taoist. I was a Taoist for a long time because of wow. his writing. Yeah, wow. deeply in the, the Chung Tuts, Lao Tuts. I don't know if you ever read any of those works. Yes, yes. Fascinating, fascinating. Yeah. And it wasn't. It's not even a religion. Just a way of thinking. Just a way of clearing the mind to think. And see things clearly, you know. I mean, yeah, we, had some, we had some required uh, required reading a while back. Uh, Dan Millman's Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Mm. That's a very good one. Um, the Art of War, of course, done Sun Tzu's Art of War. Mm. And I uh, see it's another one that's got, uh, of course, Masashi Book of Five Rings. And you read you've read all these books, haven't you? Are you kidding? I read. I'm, I got to show you. Next time we do this, you're going to see my book collection. You're going to love it. You're going to be like, wow. We're going to have you back on just talk about your reading. And I don't just like, read the book the one time. I read three, four times. Okay. And I label it with tape. The first time I read it, red tape. Second time I read it, white tape. The, the, the third time, blue tape. And it's labeled on the binders when you see the binders. That Yeah, that's that's very good, very smart. Because usually... If you read a book once, there's only you'd be lucky it's if ten percent so, stuck so much you with can, you. You can grab. Yeah, you, you're only going to absorb so much. Like there's there's a handful of books that you could pretty much reread your entire life, and that's yeah, more valuable than reading like a thousand still books. Get, in my opinion, and still get something new. I agree. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very very good stuff. Hey, we usually, I think we covered for the most part, everything we wanted to cover today. And like Brian said, we're going to have to get you back. We usually keep these things at about an hour. Uh, anybody in the audience watching live, you got any questions you'd like to ask before we take off here? 
See if anything comes. You got a guy, Paul Venus, K1, kickbox, uh, kickboxing and boxing. Yes, Viking, my brother. You must know him. Looks like well, I do. Here. Yeah, I mean, he had made a um, Instagram thing about me before. I don't know if this is his real channel. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not because, you know, there's a lot of fake accounts out there. But, yeah, yeah I do. I am aware of the guy. The guy's aware of me. He's an amazing – actually, he's an undefeated kickboxer. And me and the guy, uh, Karate Marty from the U.K., the 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 famous ceiling kick brian uh we're trying to get him a fight in our event hopefully which we do next year in 2024 but nobody wants to fight paul venus because he's undefeated and he's a beast and he's really good but anyway oh speaking of competitive fighting is that something you ever thought about or looked into david no uh everything that we do is survival combat street ready stuff um the trophies that you take home would be survival you you live and fight another day that's mm -hmm our trophy. We don't believe in any of the trophies. Not to take anything away from those guys that that uh that are on a tournament circuit and you name it. But no, we don't do none of that. Okay. I've never been intrigued by that. I thought it I thought it was a great way to express yourself and to sure. show off some of your techniques and so forth. But like I said, that's a controlled environment. We're talking uncontrolled. You know, I'd like to talk with you offline a little bit about something Tim and I are doing called the Philly Shell concept. It's just oh nice yeah, it, a lot of people don't understand it. It's not a defensive position that people think it is. But we use it with Wing Chun guys, karate guys. Uh -huh. uh, you can use it in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Uh, have, have you tried any dirty boxing? Yeah, we do it. We have it. We do 52 blocks. We do it on light girly every Friday. I figured that. I figured we that. do a live with him every Friday. Tim and him I do a live. I figured you together. did. I figured you did. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Hey, um, I hang out a little bit, David. I got to ask you something, but I okay. think we could close this show out because we're going to get you back anyway. Oh, one, one last question, I guess. Is there like what what books are you reading right now? I know you reread certain books. Like what what what's on your current reading list right now? Just out of um, curiosity. Right now, um, I haven't got a chance to read some stuff. Been kind of out of the because. What happens with me it's pretty funny i call them phases there's a phase in my there's a phase in my life like for six months straight i'm i'm reading something I'm just i gotta pick up stuff and read now sure. i'm not in that phase of kind of absorbing knowledge right now i've been more business orientated kind of getting my business off the ground and pushing things and the magic thing so yeah i haven't really been delving into many books lately yeah, it, it makes sense. I go through phases too where I try to allot a certain amount of time per day, but lately because I've been so busy with everything else, I haven't. What one book though I did buy that one of my readers suggested funny enough. <laughs> I haven't cracked it open yet. It's called The Subtle the Art subtle of Not Art Giving of an F. F. And that's because I, I like deal with that. like a lot of trolls lately. Like so that. somebody recommended this. Dude, just read this book, man. Like F those guys. And, well, you know, anyway. Hey, hey, uh, Viking! I just want to put it out again to everybody. Uh, please, I am looking for trolls. I do feel Philly insignificant in life. I will take any attention, and I'm serious, good or bad. As long as you're thinking about me, please. Me, uh, my channel needs trolls. I get 148 subscribers. I will take 20,000 trolls. You can say anything horrible about me. I don't mind. Please. I need somebody stalking me. I don't see any comments in here about me and how terrible my punch is or anything like that. I'm, but anyways, I'm just You know what they out. say. You know what they say. They say that you're, whatever it is that you're doing, if you haven't got at least three or four haters or trolls or seven haters or trolls by the end of the week that you're not doing it right. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to you say. You got to step up your game, Brian. You're not that's doing it right, game, man. man. You step up your game, man. Your 2024 goals. We got to get some trolls to your channel. So tell everybody your channel real quick so they can I keep start trying trolling. to herd them over to my channel because they'll make a comment someday because I'll comment something about uh, about Viking and then they'll be like, rah, 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 and I'll say, take it to my channel. Just go over there. I'll, leave I'll tell you what'll be help. funny, Brian. You, you might get the trolls over to your channel, but just talking crap about me. <laughs> so they still yeah, want to be a please, <laughs> you can do that there. We'll be the bastion for that because I I want to get monetized. I do need three thousand or uh, four thousand subscribers. No, you only need a thousand. You need four thousand hours of watch time. Well, that's doing these lives will add that watch time. Uh, but yeah, what's your channel name, real quick, before we go? 
it's weird, but you can't find it. It's a uh, weird news in history. I got to change that, maybe I, that might be the reason why you've got the trolls because they can't find it. <laughs> even make on here, more. though, nobody says anything about me on here. Where's my attention? Make, they say it all make about it more him. Accessible, man. Make it more accessible. Good or bad. Good or bad. <laughs> attention on me. We'll, we'll get you some trolls. Don't worry, man. That's that's one of my goals next year, too, to help you out in that. that uh... <laughs> but anyway, let's cut the feed. And then we, we got to ask David a couple other things here real quick privately. Definitely. Sounds all right, good. guys. All right. You ready to go? See you, everybody. Thanks, David. Peace. Bless.